The Black Management Forum held its 45th anniversary celebrations in Santon, north of Johannesburg, on Friday night. President Sir Ramaphosa was invited as the keynote speaker. At the event, Ramaphosa lauded BMO's position on corruption, which he said it robbed genuine business leaders of opportunities, focusing his speech on corruption in the country. He said transformation policies, even without any evidence, were now being called into question. Before the president's speech, BMF President Angela Nomlala spoke harshly on corruption. Namlala joins us this evening to talk more on this. Uh, Mr. Namlala, good evening. Um, thank you so much for your time tonight. 45 years you've been with the organization, as you said last night, for 19 of these 45 years. What are some of the reflections then at a time like this, particularly where some of the business people are shutting their doors? Uh, thank you. Good evening, Sis Bongi, and good evening to your viewers, and thanks to Newsroom for having us. The experience of uh, of last night, or maybe the reflection of the 45 years of, of BMF, uh, dates back from, as Ntate Mafuna mentioned it yesterday, dates back from the early 70s, where at the time there was no, there were no black people that were allowed to be managers. Instead, they could only be public relations officers, PROs. But at that time, they dared dreamed to have a black management forum, and they pushed the boundaries at the time to make sure that they are recognized as managers. But we have moved very far from where we were, but we're certainly not where we're supposed to be. So as an organization, we believe that uh, there has been some contribution and some change that has happened, but we are very sensitive and we do recognize that many of our people in South Africa, particularly black Africans, are still uh, uh, swimming in the pool of poverty. They are still caught up in an, a severe unemployment uh, state and there is obviously a serious exclusion of black businesses into the mainstream economy. So as an organization, those are the critical concerns that we have. Which and is as you have Pardon me, which is no surprise then that yesterday much of what you spoke about focused on the issues of transformation and the president also looking into this particular issue even saying that, you know, issues around access to funding also remain a concern for business, uh, you know, people as we speak even now uh, during the lockdown. You'd remember when the president was accounting for, um, you know, some of the package that was then put aside for business people to be able to access loans, that guarantee scheme that was then given to banks as well in order to be able to fund some of the businesses during the lockdown. That money, as we heard in, you know, from the president at some point in parliament, it never found its way to black business people as the banks were reluctant to give some of this assistance. What then becomes the role of the Black Management Forum into ensuring that this changes because it certainly looks like the issue of transformation is one that this country has been singing for quite some time now. If, if you hear, Sis Bongi, where the, the input of the president about us having to engage the government uh, quite vociferously in trying to make sure that these things that you are mentioning, <clears throat> more particularly the issue of uh, uh, the survival and the support of black businesses. Uh, I said it in my speech yesterday, Bongwe, that you can never even imagine that you would get out of the quagmire that we're in of unemployment if you don't create a critical mass of black uh, businesses, black new organic businesses that could start igniting and start stimulating the economy from all quarters. Black people as entrepreneurs and black people as workers have proven for many years that they are capable, they have the fortitude, the necessary skills in the black professional space. We now possess all the skills that everybody else that is in business has. The only challenge uh, is, is what exactly you spoke about is that government is not giving and creating enough enabling environment for black businesses to thrive. And that enabling environment and government has all the levers in their disposal that they should use. We have the public investment corporation, we have the GFIs, the IDCs, the, the, the DBSAs, but there is no strategic intent. There is no strategic focus that is directly infused to make sure that successful and competent and quite uh, up to the task business people who are black 
are given the opportunity to succeed. The reality here is that Bongiwe, we are always given grants of <clears throat> one million grant for this and that, as if our intention is to run uh, uh, sort of survival businesses. The intention here, Bongiwe, if you want to create black industrialism, you must start, for instance, by giving a pie, a significant stake of Transnet to black entrepreneurs. Some of them should be even people that have worked for Transnet who understand the business. And you then allow them to go and raise money in the capital market and including the state-owned uh, uh, financial institutions, where then after they can partner on a majority or whatever the state levels are, but they must be significant enough to have an influence in the direction and the running of the business. Now, these state-owned enterprises Bongiwe, are, are functioning at a very, very limited level at the moment. They are, they, they are, their operations are not optimized uh, due to the fact that even the, the caliber of, of management that has been there is, is not adequate, but more so the strategic direction that government is giving is not there. So we are saying, if you want to uh, separate ESCO, give some of that business lines to black entrepreneurs, you create the real industrialist, not us always coming with cap in hand where black people are a 1% stake, equity stake of a conglomerate of, of, of white companies. We need new, organic, strategic, well-positioned black businesses. That's the first thing. The second thing, Wundu, I think is very important, is that to infuse or to be able to put the infrastructure that we need to stimulate our economy, Government doesn't have the resources, but there is money in the global market. There is money in South Africa. So if government would, were to partner strategically, again, with off-take agreements or even private-public partnerships, strategic ones, like we did with the IPPs. IPPs have invested 400 billion rands in our economy, uh, says Wongiwe, and there's no stories of corruption. And because there was off-take agreements, sovereign guarantees that were given, there was investment. There could be similar situations for water infrastructure, for dams, for rail infrastructure, all of those. There is money. If you go to the global markets, South Africa still remains a strategic uh, uh, investment destination. It's a lie that people would believe that investors wouldn't come, but investors are just worried about the all over the show type of strategic thinking that government possesses. I'll come to Eskom in just a moment, but as you speak, you know, of one of those critical entities then that are, you know, quite instrumental in ensuring that black businesses then are supported and even business people just in general. The Development Bank of Southern Africa right now is finding itself in an unenviable position where we've seen Scopa in recent days saying that it's going to investigate claims of mismanagement. Look, the, the one thing I mentioned, uh, Bongwe, yesterday, you can never build a country under a Thakari system. The issue of corruption is one of the biggest derailing uh, or impediments into the success of our country. This thing, and, and we are now reduced to keeping up with the so-and-so families in the, in the Zondo Commission. I don't know why we can't do that ballroom dancing at the courts, not at Zondo Commission. People that needs to be arrested must be taken to jail. There is no way, if you listen to all the stories, look at the, look at the reputation of the Minister of, of Health as we speak now. He's hanging on, on the balance because he's been just compromised by his own uh, inadequacies that had nothing to do with his great work that he was doing. So I don't know uh, why, I, and I don't think corruption is, is a problem. I think the problem is not us being able to deal with it. Because if you are stealing and you know that if you get caught, there will be serious consequences. The problem here is that we are three years down the line from the state capture period. There's not a single individual, significant individual that is rotting in jail. And I don't know, I mean, you can't get a billion rands disappearing. The, the, the money doesn't fly, the money goes through systems. You can know which bank account it moved from this to that. And I don't know what is so much of a, of a, a complicated investigation that is when, when and, and all you need, all you need, Bongiwe, is to arrest some significant individuals from those municipalities. I said yesterday, there are big chiefs there. 
who run municipalities to the to the doldrums, and they are allowed. So the departure of our development can't happen. There's no country in the world that has been built on Pagas. There's no country in the world that has survived without the state capacity to begin with. So the state capacity cannot reign in parallel to thieving and, and, and corruption. So that one is a non-negotiable for PMF. We need to get rid of thieves and then so that we can start focusing on building our country. So, um, you know, going back to what you've, you, you know, you alluded to, because I was going to ask you this question uh, just towards, um, you know, at some point in our discussion, the health minister, as you say, is finding himself in a cloud of allegations. There are calls now for him to step aside and allow this particular investigation to unfold without him at the helm. Would you agree with those who are calling for him to step aside? Look, the audacity, Bong uh, the audacity of even find uh, even finding yourself because the minister knows those people he knows that they were PAs and all of those you the, the audacity of being caught in such a situation now when everybody else is decrying co corruption I mean the level of people not taking the self care of wanting to lead and be above reproach you see you see Bongo, even at the level of PML. When I lead and I speak the way I speak, there are many people who are looking and trying to find something that could stick on me. And, and you have to make sure that as a... Um, as we try to re-establish a better line with Andile Nomlala there as he was talking to us about um, the health minister. Uh, Andile, I do understand that you're back now. Yes, uh, I, I didn't realize that I was out. So, so I think I think it's, it's it's a very plausible thing to do. If you are caught wanting colleagues, let's not let's not try to get the whole the country at ransom. If you are caught wanting and there are linkages between you and the people that did business with your department, and that is found to be a foul play, and even yourself you admit that there was some level of corruption. Therefore, you must fall on your sword. It can't be because if, if 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 the Minister of Health remains there, how many of the people that are now being tried to be removed from 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 positions of responsibility in the ruling party and he remains? Bandi the Masuku fell from on, on his sword. Now why why him would he not fall on his sword? Why if if there's any doubt, we need to build a, an environment where when you are caught napping. There are consequences without even people calling for you, like it's happening in the other parts of the world. If there's a scandal around a minister in Europe and US, that becomes a non-negotiable, the person falls. And I don't know why now people would have to be, it takes weeks, because this scandal of Minister of Health has been going on for many, for many weeks and, and he's still standing. And, and the president, I didn't ask him yesterday, I was sitting next to him, I should have directly asked him, what, 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 are, what is he doing about, about the guy? I mean, in the cabinet, there are proper ministers there. There's Kumbuzo, who's the minister of SMMEs, whom we love in the organization. There's, there's Kubai, Momlo or Kubai. Those ministers are young. They are driving transformation. Their work is felt. But now they have to be encompassed with some old people who are thieves, who are trying to hide and derail the progress that we are trying to achieve as a country. We need to be decisive so that people that are trying to derail us with their actions that are, un are, are not aligned with what we want to achieve as a country must be put aside. There are many capable people that can replace them. I think uh, maybe you should also have asked the president then about another one of uh, his ministers, deputy minister, if I can even put it that way, because he's the deputy minister of state security, Zizi Kodwa. There's allegations that have come out in the state capture commission of inquiry around him having possibly received uh, payments and also luxury accommodation. Do you think these allegations are being entertained enough in the public domain particularly because since we've heard about these alleged payments, we haven't even heard about a process that may even be unfolding within the ruling party to try and ask him to account or anything. 
Thanks, Mundo. <clears throat> no, the president went uh, to yesterday's evening to celebrate the 45 years of PMF. I didn't want to get to a discussion with him about the crooked ways of his comrades. Uh, I, we know that in, in, in the ANC, I mean, uh, half of those people are caught up in all sorts of things every day. So if I had started opening that discussion with him, I'm sure we were not going to get to the celebrations that we wanted and asked him and humbly asked him to come and join us with. But look, I, I, I don't want to really get into that discussion. Uh, not that I defend anyone, but I think the ANC, we all know that it's in the dogs. Uh, that if people don't want to admit that there is nothing left there, to be quite honest, if, if I were to be very precise with you, we have, I mean, we are being led by the barbarians that the Sitja Kanyako saw at the gate. They are not even at the gate, they are inside running our country. That's the reality we need to live with. But we still have hope because not all of them, there are still individuals that that we think, and I even we even said to the president yesterday that our support to him is not sacrosanct, is purely because we believe that as far as things are going now, the day we know that, for instance, the money that were paid in the in the in his campaign and the people that contributed there are doing deals with the state, is the day we will also abandon it, because we believe that our country cannot stand on its own two feet with compromised leaders. And we, we, we have a history in our country where we had President Mbeg, we had President Mandela, we had many other leaders even before apartheid, before we, we had a democracy, leaders of outstanding character, people that have never been caught napping. And there is no second chance if you are a leader to make the first impression. You don't ever, as a leader, get caught up because all of those things, even if people are throwing mud at you, they can only stick because you have compromised yourself one way or the other. So we're saying it's, it's very clear, it's evident. Black people are living in abject poverty. And the biggest reason behind that is because we have self-serving individuals who are running our country. People who get elected as councillors who were living in those townships and in those squalor, the next day they come there on a Sunday only on meetings with big cars. They don't understand, they don't want to serve the very same people that elected them. Forget the fact that they are completely illiterate. 60% or 70% of councillors in our country have a metric as the highest qualification, but they approve and process budgets of billions of rand, bigger than even Standard Bank's budget. In, and you can imagine a standard bank having a metric at X level, a matriculant at X level. So these are the problems that are self-inflicted, and we need a decisive, we, we support the ruling party, but the ruling party has to get itself in order. And we know that before the ruling party had the capacity, it's not like we are asking them for something that we never saw and experienced with them. It's just that they have decided to take themselves in this path now. And that path is not acceptable to South Africans. And we will never shy away from telling them that every day, whenever it's necessary, that we can't be led by thugs. And we think that thugs would give prosperity to us whilst they're stealing every little thing that is supposed to come to the people. Mr. Dumlal, I'm going to ask you to pause there for now. Uh, we have to go for a quick ad break, but when we come back, I need us to talk about an issue that you've been very vocal about, and those are the issues, of course, around Eskom load shedding, and also this probe that has then cleared the group CEO of the company. We continue this conversation in just a moment. Let's continue our conversation then with BMF President Andile Nomlala. Mr. Nomlala, um, as we round up our conversation, I can't let you go without asking you about this issue that your organization has been very vocal about in the public domain. We saw this week Eskim, um, the board releasing a statement then that it has cleared uh, the group CEO of racism allegations. And, of course, this was a probe that was, uh, you know, instituted by um, the power utility and, you know, was run um, by advocate Semenya SC. What, what is your reaction then to this particular development? Uh, uh, thank you, Bumgeo. And uh, look, <laughs> I told you, uh, I think we had an interview, me and you. 
we are not kids, uh, Bongi, and we know that uh, the, I saw, by the way, uh, an image from the ESCOM board, uh, from the ESCOM CEO, requesting a meeting with us. Uh, we have met him several times before. We will meet him again, I think it's on the 15th of June. Look, uh, Bongi, I, I will tell you something, <clears throat> a very, very, very serious. There was a report that was done, <clears throat> I won't mention by who, a very senior former mining CEO that was tasked to do a report to look at the capabilities and the skill set that are at ESCOM. And that report was given to the powers that be, I won't mention which powers are those. And it says, let me just give you a very pure, clear description. It says the group CEO of ESCOM doesn't know the difference between a knee and an elbow. Now, our issue with Andrew Derrida has never been the issue of race. I told you a long time ago. The issue from where he comes from to where he is now is his competency. The guy is not capable of running ESCOM. Then go and also look at the board of ESCOM and tell me and, and we have respect, by the way, for many of those professionals, those are black professionals, but the seriousness of the job, ESCOM has a 400 billion rand debt. The complexity of that and the business itself has an operating uh, expenditure or, or, or working capital of 100 plus billion rand a year. That is bigger than the top five JSC listed companies. But you would have a person of Andrew's caliber to manage that complexity. And, and I know, look, I, I wouldn't, even though we have a very plausible discussion with Andrew, but I wouldn't relent on the reality that South Africans experience him every day. The guy took us to load shedding during lockdown when people were not in office, people were not doing anything with electricity, but we didn't have electricity. And not so long ago, the same power stations the same system of electricity was run without load jetting for two, three years. Now, now people want us to justify, and more so that is white. We need to expose white incompetence without shying away from that. The guy knows himself. He's there serving people, certain people's interests, and we know that. Who are these he's people? There. No, no, uh, uh, Bongo, is, is that, that guy on a daily basis, he knows where he gets his instructions to run his home. One day he must come here and tell you that. He knows that he is completely inadequate to the requirements that are there for, for him to run his home. And by the way, even when he was appointed, there were other competent people than him. Now, Mr. Numlala, when you, when you really read what um, Advocate Semenya then has to say around the issues of racism, and I'd no, like to, to borrow don't, from the statement. Don't, don't, Can I don't borrow from their statement? Up. I'd really like to get your response to this. He says, regarding Mr. Chitangano's allegation that Eskom's group chief executive, Mr. Dereta, was guilty of racism and preferred a white company above another that is black-owned on racial grounds, Advocate Semenya reports that Mr. Chitangano denied making these allegations, despite knowing that these allegations of racism were wrong, um, egregious, yes. false, baseless, and lacking any substantiation. The CPO did not publicly deny them. So it sounds then that um, Advocate Semenya then is saying that this was not repeated to him when he was conducting this probe. Look, uh, Vim Trenko uh, forgets Semenya. Vim, ESCOM has been using, it's their play to just go and find some reputable advocates. The people have to eat, uh, and we understand that some of them are prepared to sell their souls for, the, for, the, for their bread. Now, we are talking about building a country on a completely different platform, a platform of integrity, a platform where there are leaders who are ready to lay themselves for the benefit of South Africans that are living in poverty. Now, if we're gonna be busy with people that have to be paid for their work, and we must take legitimacy to that because they are advocates, I, then, then I'm not interested in that discussion. The discussion I'm interested in is that under the director's record of 
running ESCOM must be put into scrutiny and we measure it on its face value. Why are we having load shedding? What does he know about generating electricity? And are, how far has he been making that work? Are these some Those of the issues you'll be tabling to him when you meet the uh, when you meet with him on the 15th of june and are you then also if i can seek in this question as well are you then also saying that he should not be in that position and should actually be sacked look if if we had electricity now because the, when i'm talking to you now i, I could be low shedded right so if we had electricity now I wouldn't be discussing this. So I don't know what Andrew wants to meet with us on. And as BMF, we meet with all the state-owned enterprise CEOs. We will meet with him. But he knows our position. It, the issue of, of, of Chitangano and, and all of those, we don't defend people that are caught wanting about anything that has to do with corruption. That one I must be very clear on. I don't know what, how to what extent, and we would not defend any black professional that is caught wanting when it comes to doing the work as per the requirements of his job or her job. Now, if outside of that, you then have a messiah, typically of Andre. Andre took a job. It's a tough job, we know, and many other people didn't want to take a job. But we can't have a person only on the basis of that. The fellow is incompetent by the standards of the electricity we have in our country and the complexity of the business he understands. He couldn't run a third, a, 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 a one third of a business of ESCOM size called Nampad. He put that company into the dogs. And Tina, because we're gullible, vulnerable, always willing to be served people, we took him to a strategic state-owned institution that the entire economy of our country is dependent on. And the guy is collapsing that economy because there's no electricity to run an economy. You talk to the capital market, I talk to people in the investment space. They will never put a sign at ESCOM because they don't have trust in the type of leadership that is at ESCOM. So and ask me if ESCOM now can go and raise money, where do they raise money from? Not in the capital markets in South Africa. So talking about ESCOM and raising money, the organization is finding itself in debt, which it's battling to manage. But uh, what we have also seen then is that what Mr. Dereda has then been trying to do is to also make sure that they're not spending um, money that may appear unreasonable for some of the things like a toilet paper, for example, a single tie toilet paper costing around 26 rand, and he's trying to bring those prices down, and also 51 rand per black refuse bag, and also around 21 rand for a liter of milk. He's, are you saying you're not even don't, confident that he's way. trying to find money somewhere here? Don't you forget the media frenzy, Carol Payton type of front play about under the rate. We don't want milk from ESCOM. We want electricity from ESCOM. Any other unnecessary things that you're talking about, we are not interested in them. Obviously, if people are inflating things, it's a duty of whoever, even a manager, to manage those things. Don't get into the boat of the beautifying and the media frenzy of business day and other people trying to legitimize Andre. Andre is inadequate by virtue of South Africans not having electricity. And there's no electricity. That's the issue here. And the guy doesn't know what to do with that. He's employed to provide electricity. The businesses in our country need electricity to stimulate and revive the economy. And there is no electricity. That's his job. If it was a black guy who had not given us electricity, that guy would be tossed a long time ago. A long time ago. You can't not give us electricity during lockdown when there's a quarter of the electricity we need and we must defend you. We're not going to do that. And we are not speaking to be capturing headlines in the business day. We are South Africans and we are leaders in South Africa who would stand for the truth irrespective of the consequences mm. that comes with it. Andrew and is not an adequate CEO, including his board.
by the way, Professor Mokopa, we like him, but he's a professor. He belongs into some university there, mm. not running ESCOM. You can't entrust ESCOM to the type of people you have there if you believe ESCOM is the critical state institution that is made out to be. Mm. All right. Mr. Nomlala, thank you so much for your time. Certainly, it's always a pleasure to, to talk to you. And I certainly do hope that on the 15th then, after you have your meeting, with ESCOM, you'll be able to indulge us about maybe what may have transpired there, so we can also get a sense from you on how that meeting went. Thank you so much for your time. Certainly do appreciate it. That is the PMF President uh, Andile Nomlala, certainly not mincing his words, as you would have heard then um, as he was talking about ESCOM. Let's go now.